This morning we started looking at sins against the Holy Spirit with the realization that the Spirit is a person of the Godhead, just as the Father and the Son. He has all of the attributes, all of the prerogatives of deity, and as such he can be sinned against. This morning we (coughs) noted the subject of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, which was done in the context of a miracle in which the Pharisees had ascribed the power of doing that miracle to to Beelzebub. And Jesus upon that said that anyone who blasphemes the Holy Spirit would not have forgiveness. He says, neither in this world nor in the world to come. This world would be, or this age would be a better translation maybe, for our understanding, it was the age of the Mosaic age that Jesus was doing those miracles in. The age to come would be the Christian dispensation. Thus, during that period of time in which the apostles and those who they laid hands on were performing miracles. It's not a miracle, it's not a, thus a sin that can be committed today because we realize that Christ can forgive any and all sins. In Acts 7 and verse 51, Stephen accused the uh, Sanhedrin of resisting the Holy Spirit. Uh, The word resist means to oppose or to strive against. And he says, as your fathers have done, so do ye. And if you go back and look at their fathers, that's during that Old Testament period, you see that literally any of the, the prophets that God would send them to them, they, put them, they killed them, persecuted them, rebelled against them, and thus the fathers persecuted and slew the prophets because they refused to accept what the prophets taught. And now then, he says, you're doing the same thing. You're refusing to accept the teaching that came through the, the prophets or through the Holy, that the Holy Spirit is given. In Ephesians 4 and verse 30, Paul writes, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. The word grieve is to make sorrowful to cause pain or grief, to distress or offend. And thus he's saying to grieve not. Do not cause pain or grief, distress. Don't offend that Holy Spirit of God. That's the Holy Spirit. The context of this is stated in the midst of differing admonitions. But there's special emphasis in these admonitions to the proper use of the tongue. And thus, when he says to grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, in the midst of the tongue and the admonitions regarding the tongue, when we act contrary to the commands of the Spirit, especially in the area of language, then we grieve the Spirit. When we use foul, corrupt language, when we use wicked language, language in a sinful way, then we are grieving the Spirit. We're causing Him distress, pain, and grief because he wants us to use our tongue and our study in James that uh, Paul has been going through on Sunday and Wednesday, they have been emphasizing lately the use of the tongue and how powerful it is, how it can be used for good, how it can be used for evil. But 
there's a concentration here. You use it for good, and you don't grieve the Spirit. You use it for evil, and you do grieve the Spirit. We need to make sure that we use our words and our language, our tongue, to build up and to strengthen, to encourage, to edify others, not to destroy them, not to tear them down, and certainly we would not use our tongues in a way that would blaspheme God, which many times is being done today under the guise of a euphemism, a word that is a substitute for another word. And when we talk about euphemisms, not all of them are bad. Some of them are good. Uh, some of them, you see that in the Bible, you, uses euphemisms. Uh, the word no is oftentimes used for sexual relations. Well, it's a euphemism for that. Uh, the Bible, uh, we use pass away many times for someone who's died. Why? Because it's a softer, easier way. It means the same thing. There's not a change in meaning except it is a softer, more accepted way of saying it. Today, we use euphemisms all the time. How many, how many times do we hear, oh my God? That's just a curse word, curse phrase. Jeez, Jesus. Gosh, euphemism for God. Golly, same thing. We need to be aware of our language and avoid using those things. But then it just also corrupt communication is one of the things that is mentioned within the context. You don't speak and of things that are just inappropriate to talk about. And thus, you use language and said that will build up and strengthen people. When we use that type of language, we are grieving the Holy Spirit. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19, Paul has a very short statement, quench not the Spirit. The word quench comes from a word which means to extinguish a fire or things on fire, to suppress or stifle. Something is on fire and, you know, we want to get some water usually and spray water on it to quench it, to put it out. That's what Paul is saying in relationship to quench not the spirit. Don't put it out. Don't suppress it. Beginning in 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 9, where it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Beginning at that point, Paul gives us several viewpoints. First, there's a viewpoint of God, or a view of God. Then there's a view toward Jesus. Then Paul gives a view toward elders, how we are to, to obey them and submit to them. And then others, how a view toward others and our relationship with others and how we are to treat them. Last, Paul gives eight views toward self. In the midst of these views toward self is this admonition, quench not the spirit. When we talk about this, though, we have to also understand the age in which it's given. This was given during the age of miracles. It was a miraculous time. If you look at verse 20, the next verse, he says, despise not prophesyings. The prophesyings that is mentioned deals with miracles. They did not have the written 
New Testament. They couldn't pick up a book such as this and say, turn to such and such uh, book, this chapter and this verse. It was in the process of being given to them, being written down. Also, they were speaking that word that God was giving. That's the idea of prophesying. It was someone who was speaking forth, and the idea of prophesy is literally to speak forth. They were speaking forth for God. This was during the miraculous, they had the miraculous power that God was giving them what they needed to speak. And so there's that admonition, despise not prophesying. Right before it, quench not the spirit. Thus, apparently, some were prohibiting the miraculous work of the Spirit. The specifics, though, as we see in verse 20, when he says, despise not prophesying, is this revealing of God's will to man. That's the idea of prophesying. And so, quench not the Spirit, despise not prophesying, Here's that revealing God's will to man miraculously because they didn't have the written record at that time. And so God giving them those words in which to speak and they were despising it. And by doing so, they were quenching the spirit. They were trying to put out the spirit. Now then today, God has, as we mentioned revealed his will for us through the Bible. The application of this <coughs> in regards to us would be when we put out the fire of God's word within us, then we're quenching the spirit. We're quenching that word of God within us. We're putting it out. Have you ever seen someone, and I know we all have, who they have God's word within them, but over time they start putting it out, and we start seeing them drift away from God, and after a while they're total apostates. What have they done? They quench that word of God that is within them, and thus quenching the spirit even though this, specifically dealing with the miraculous age, we certainly see the application of it even today within the quenching of God's word within the Bible. In Hebrews 10 and verse 29, the Hebrews writer says, Of how much sore punishment? Suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and done despot unto the spirit of grace. That phrase, the spirit of grace, is again having reference to the Holy Spirit. And you could go back into the book of Hebrews and you could see the idea that is being expressed there dealing with the spirit. This word despite... It literally means to insult or to treat with contempt. They have done despot or despite unto the spirit of grace. They have treated it or they insulted, they treated with content that spirit of grace. The book of Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians primarily. certainly has an application to all Christians. But specifically, it was written to these Jews who had become Christians through various reasons, or for various reasons at this point in time, many of them were going back and leaving Christianity and going back into Judaism. Apostasy, such as that was, 
brings eternal damnation. Thus, they were treating with contempt. They were doing despot unto that spirit of grace, that spirit which brought grace to them, the grace of God that brings salvation. And they were treating it with contempt by leaving Christianity and going back into Judaism. By going back to that Mosaic law, they were saying the law of Christ, that which Christ brought, the grace, the salvation that is there, is worthless. It is of no value to me. And so these Jewish Christians going back into Judaism, they're saying the spirit of grace is worthless, has no value to us. And thus, the Hebrews writer was encouraging them to remain faithful to Christ because leaving Christ, rejecting that salvation that is there, will bring a greater punishment. Notice the start of verse 29 of how much sore punishment, how much greater punishment shall the person be thought worthy of who hath done these things. And notice, they've trodden underfoot the Son of God. Why? Because they've treated him with contempt. They've left Christ, the Son of God, to go back into Moses and the Mosaic system. Counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. Here is the blood of Christ that he shed upon Calvary's tree. What did they think of it? Well, they just turned their nose up on it and go back into Judaism. They substituted or left the blood of Christ for animal sacrifices and rejected that sacrifice that Christ made upon the cross for them. That's counting the blood of the covenant, covenant in the New Testament, wherewith he was sanctified. There's no sanctification back under the law of Moses. It could do nothing for them. The law of Christ sanctified them. Christianity, they became saints. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 2, it says they were called saints. King James substitutes called to be saints. To be is not there. They were just called saints. Why? Because they had been sanctified in Christ. And thus, they considered that an unholy thing. One worth it. One of value. They had truly insulted, they had treated with contempt that spirit of grace, the Holy Spirit. When you make a comparison going back to that first part, and how, how much sore punishment or how much greater punishment, under the law of Moses, those people who rejected the law of Moses transgressed it. They died physically. And the Hebrews writer is saying, while they died physically under that Old Testament, under that law of Moses, there is a greater punishment than physical death. The only way in which that can be understood is that there is a spiritual death of eternal torment. That's the greater punishment. And that's what's going to take place to those who leave Christianity and go back into that Mosaic law. Or for us, in application, it would be leaving Christ to go back into anything. There's going to be a greater punishment. Let me make an application of these principles that we've been talking about this morning and this afternoon. First, there is the rejecting and the resisting of God's word. God's message to us regarding our salvation, regarding the Christian life, how we worship God, these things, those things are easy to understand. 
they're easy to, to obey. God doesn't put such requirements upon us that it makes it impossible for us to do his will. But when we refuse to hear it, we are quenching the Spirit. When we refuse to hear that plan of salvation, which many people do nowadays, they're quenching the Spirit. When we refuse to hear God's message as to how we are to live in the Christian age, then we're resisting, we're quenching that Spirit. We're resisting him when we resist his will, his word. And when we refuse to live according to the precepts that he has given, and especially when we speak evil, when we use our tongues for those evil purposes, then we certainly grieve the Spirit. As Christians, we need to learn to use that tongue in a proper way. When we reject and treat what the Spirit has done for us, His great, we treat it insultingly, then we despise the Spirit. We cannot live and accept God and do that, those things. And when we do such things, there is a point in time in which it becomes impossible for us to obey the truth. Not because of the power of the gospel, not because God is unable to save us. By no means, he's able to save us from any sin. No matter what we've done in life, God is able to forgive us and to cleanse us from our sin. John, or John would write in 1 John 1 and verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. So we can be cleansed from all sin. But the problem is with us. We can become so hardened by sin that we just simply cannot change. In John, the 12th chapter, verse 39 and verse 40, it says, Therefore they could not believe, because as Isaiah said again, He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their hearts, and be converted, and I should heal them. They had become so hardened by the deceitfulness of sin, that they could not see with their eyes, they could not understand with their heart, and so they would not be converted. They could not be converted. Why? Because their hardness of heart. And Christ was thus unable to heal them. Why? Because of his inability? No, certainly not, but because of their hardness of heart because they had gotten and reached that point where their heart was so hard it was impossible for anything to reach them. In Hebrews 3 and verse 13, Hebrew writer brings the same idea up when he says, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin." He recognized that sin can come into our hearts and deceive us to such an extent that our hearts are hardened and we will not be saved. And so he says, exhort one another daily. You need this exhortation so that does not happen to you. But we need to be careful lest it does. There's one other passage that I want to mention, even though it is not specifically a sin against the Holy Spirit, but many times is lumped into this, this idea. And that's in 1 John 5, in verse 16 and verse 17, where John will say, if any man see it, 
If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin not unto death, or there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he should pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. John presents us two sins. One is a sin unto death. One is not a sin unto death. This has caused people untold problems in their understanding of God's word. What does he mean, a sin not unto death, and a sin unto death? Death here is not physical death. He's dealing with spiritual death. In Ephesians 2 and verse 1, Paul mentions, You hath, hath he quickened who were dead in, sin, in trespasses and sins. Paul had written in, to the Romans in Romans 6 and verse 23 that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. The payment, the wages of sin is death. But isn't that true with all sin? Yet... John is talking here about a sin that's not unto death and one that is unto death. Notice also that as John see, speaks this, and he says, if any man see his brother, he's talking about those who are Christians. He's not discussing those people who are, as we would say, aliens. They are non-Christians. They're not under discussion here. So he's talking about Christians. And he talks about the sin unto death and sin not unto death. It's really very simply explained by the book. And specifically, if you go back in the very first chapter, and as you read, starting in First uh, John 1, John is writing that our joy may be full, he says in verse 4. In verse 5, he says, This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, the idea of darkness is sin. He says, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Jesus Christ. His son cleanseth us from all sins. At this point, we're starting to get a hint as to that which John now describes in chapter 5 as a sin unto death and a sin not unto death. Because here, if we are walking in the light, we have the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us, and the idea of cleanseth, the E-T-H ending, and I appreciate the King James because of those endings many times, shows a continuous action. In the Greek, it's a present tense which shows that. So it's continuing to cleanse us from all sins. He does make the warning, verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Skip down to verse 10 and again he emphasizes, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and the truth is not, and his word is not in us. So here he's describing that one who's Christ, who is a Christian, who is walking in the light, verse 7. But even though he is walking, and that walking again is a present tense, it is continuous action, he continues to walk that way. That's his lifestyle. Yet, even though that is the Christian's lifestyle, walking in the light, John is recognizing in verse 8 and verse 10 that the Christian's going to stumble and fall at times. There's going to be those occasions in which he commits sin even though his lifestyle is walking in the light. 
Now then, we go back to verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here's this Christian. He is, to the very best of his ability, walking in the ways of God. He's walking in the light. He is trying with all of his power, with all of his ability, to live the, the way that God wants him to live. To have the attitudes that God wants him to have, to apply those attitudes to his life. But as he's living that way, he stumbles and falls. And he commits this, this act of sin. But verse 9 says, if we confess our sins. And the idea of confessing our sins is we continue to confess our sins. He says, one is walking in the light. He recognizes I'm going to commit sin, and he's continually confessing his sins. Now what happens? Then we have that blood of Jesus Christ, verse 7, cleansing us of all sins. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What is that? That is a Christian who has committed a sin, even though he's walking in the light, he is confessing his sins, and God forgives him of his sin, and thus that is a sin that's not unto death. Well, what about the sin that's unto death then? The same one who is a brother, and he commits a sin not unto death or a sin under death. What's that? If the sin not under death is that sin that he repents of, he confesses, then the sin that's unto death is that here's this brother, he's been walking in the light, but he commits sin, and now then he refuses to repent of it. He refuses to confess his sins. Well, what the, happens then? Well, the opposite of that which happens if he confesses his sins. If he confesses his sin, God's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If he refuses to confess his sins, if he refuses to repent, then he does not have the blood of Christ cleansing him. God will not forgive his sins. God will not cleanse him of his unrighteousness. What is that? That's a sin that leads to death because of his refusal to repent, his refusal to confess his sins. And thus that Christian who wants to have that heaven's home will continue to live that life of service and dedication to God, walking the way that God wants us to walk. And in that walk, continually confesses his sins, that yes, I have sinned. I'm sorry for them. I confess them and I want to do right. Help me to live and overcome those sins. That's the sin that's not unto death. That individual shall have life. But to become a Christian, we must obey the truth. We must obey the truths that God has set forth, that which the Spirit has given. And thus, upon our faith, repent of our sins. Make a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and then be baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. And then as a child of God, we're careful within our life to give heed to what the Spirit teaches through the Word of God. And if we should commit an act of sin as a child of God, then we confess our sins and we can obtain forgiveness of them when we will confess those sins and repent of them. If we don't, we need to be careful that that sin does not harden our hearts against God's word so that it becomes impossible for us to repent and to change and return to it. If you need this afternoon to obey that gospel and become a Christian, or if you need to repent and come back into him and be faithful once again, and why not do so as we stand and sing this invitation song?